to turn to the section of your program where we have our mission statement. We'll do a mission statement together. The Brayton Seventh-day Adventist Church, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, is committed to leading others to become disciples of Christ through the proclamation of the three angels' message and the promotion of unity and quality of life for all. On the first Sabbath of 2009, the Lord called us to worship. He said, come, come now. Let us reason together, say the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will heat the best from the land. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Stop being anxious and watchful, for I am your God. The church is called to worship. We continue in our praise and our worship by singing of hymn number four. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. Him number four. church family happy new year my church family hasn't God been a good God hasn't God been good to you if God has been good to you let me hear you say praise the Lord if God has been good to you let me hear you say thank you Jesus you know one of the good things about a new year one of the great things about a new year is that it brings with it a feeling of freshness, a renewal, a feeling of another chance to start over, 
to correct the mistakes of the past. Are you with me? To make plans for the future. It has an energy, a kind of vigor, vitality to it. It's like a milestone. It's a stepping stone. It's a landmark. Because of this feeling that accompanies a new year, it's a time that many people use to make plans, to set goals, and to commit to resolutions. Well, this morning, I want to welcome you to God's house in a whole new way. We are all going to take advantage of this energy and vigor that accompanies the new year. First of all, I want to ask all my visiting friends to stand. Please stand so that we can recognize you. Amen. All our visitors, please stand. Now, secondly, what I want is I want two members to stand beside each visitor. So members, look around and start moving. I need two members to stand beside each visitor. I want you to flank them, one on the right and one on the left. If you don't have space, make some space. If visitors are standing beside each other, make space so we can have a member, one on the right and one on the left of each visitor. Now it's a new year and I want all our members standing beside our visitor to do something special for our visitor today. I want you to speak a blessing into the lives of this visitor for the year 2009. I want you to hug them and I want you to tell them something special that you want the Lord to do for them this year. Go ahead. Hug our visitors and speak a blessing into the lives of our visitors. All right, visitors, you may be seated. Each of our visitors has had two persons speak an extra special blessing into their lives for this year. I'd also like to welcome in a special way uh, two new couples that are worshiping with us today, um, brother and sister Luther. And uh, um, visiting with us is a new couple, Yannick and her husband. I'm going to ask you to stand so that the church can recognize you. I'm not seeing them. They're on the outside? Okay. Um, well, I'm sure you're still hearing me, and it is my privilege to speak a blessing into your lives for 2009. I pray that the Lord will bless you with happiness and that he will infuse your home with his presence and bind you with cords of love that shall not be broken. Now, you know, church, we use our mouths to do so many other things. Let's endeavor to speak a blessing into the lives of each other for 2009. Now, we're going to take it on at a family level. I want you to look at the person sitting on your right and on your left, and I want you to speak a blessing into their lives for this year, an extra special thing that you want Jesus to do for them for this year. Go ahead, speak a blessing into the lives of your brothers and sisters. Doesn't it feel good to want something good for somebody else? Doesn't it? And isn't it great to know that someone else wants something good for you? I challenge you this year to speak blessings into the lives of your brothers and sisters. Instead of criticizing, speak life. Instead of gossiping, pronounce a blessing. Instead of causing tears, let's leave a smile. I pray that God will bless you abundantly, exceeding your wildest imaginations in 2009. Open up your heart. He is blessing you right now. At this time, we'll be blessed with special music by the Benjamin family. comes 
what may, we will serve the Lord. As children, our parents made that decision unitedly that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Today, we have gone our different ways, but we have resigned in our hearts that come what may, like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Church, this morning, as a church family and as individual families, I hope that you will resign and determine in your hearts that come what may, you will also serve the Lord. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from St. John chapter 5. That's St. John chapter 5, reading of verses 1 to 9. St. John chapter 5, verses 1 to 9, and we'll read alternate verses. I'll begin. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And, 
and a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. And part us to kneel wherever possible as we pray. God of our fathers, the immovable rock, the great I am. Today we are grateful for this privilege, Lord, of coming into your presence to worship and to lavish you with our praise. We want to thank you for your manifold goodness towards us. We want to thank you, Lord, for your leadership in our lives. We want to thank you, Lord, for your positioning. As we come this morning, we recognize that it's not anything good we have done, but it's because of your love, your mercies, and your grace, why we are so privileged to be in your presence today. We ask, loving Lord, that you will come down in copious showers today and that you'll bless us individually and collectively. In our midst this morning are those who have been bruised and battered. There are those who have experienced difficulties and hardship. There are those, Lord, who have cause to rejoice because every step of the way, you have hold their hands and led them along the rugged terrain of life. There are those in our midst this morning, Father, who are sensing a new experience with you. They want to be carried to a new level. Lord, we know that you are here this morning to embrace all of us who have come into worship. We ask, Lord, that you will take us as we are and make us into what you would have us to be. We want to pray in a very special way for your manservant who will deliver the word of life to us today. Lord, we know that he's not 100% well, but Lord, you have called him. We ask, Lord, that you'll empower him so that as he speak, his word will come true with clarity and conviction and that our hearts will be touched and that we all will be closer drawn to you. We commit ourselves and this service in its entirety into your charge. We ask that you'll overrule and direct in all aspect of it today. We pray in Jesus' name.
the word of God declares to us that the word is a lamp to our feet and is a light to our path. The one God has appointed today to give us his words is our own pastor, Pastor Jeff Jefferson. After the singing of the Benjamin family, hear ye him. So long I've searched for life's meaning and slaved by the world and my grief, but the door. how quickly one year has passed by 
it seems like just the other day I stood right here greeted you and said happy new year and 12 months have already passed 2008 is now history and here we are on the first Sabbath of 2009 to God be the glory what do you say it is indeed a joy to have the Benjamin family with us today and in the family we have so many testimonies of God's miracle working power I'm also happy to have sister Rob with us today another testimony of God's miraculous power and I believe that in a congregation here and for many of you who are joining us via blessed television there are so many of you who can testify that God has exceeded your expectation and so today as we worship him and as we give ourselves to him in dedication in service in faith it is my hope that indeed 2009 will bring us rich blessings chief among them will be spiritual blessing as we draw closer and closer to the Lord I want you to think with me for a moment it's Christmas Eve you're standing in the bank unfortunately you received your salary check late and so you are here standing in the bank to encash your check you are amazed as to how many individuals have waited for the last moment to get their business done you thought the line was going to be very short because everybody else would have been out doing Christmas shopping but here before you are a hundred persons you begin to get a little impatient you begin to tap your feet to play with your pen you begin to fidget you begin to look up the line and somehow the tellers seem to be moving extraordinarily slow today you are on a hurry you can't afford to wait you think of your options and then you realize that you really have none you must wait finally the cashier hands you your money hurriedly you rush out of the bank and you made it, you make your way quickly to the supermarket you push the door and you're amazed at how many persons are still in the supermarket doing last minute shopping Oh, you can't endure another line, another endless wait in a lengthy line. You begin to think of your options. How can I get out of this? But you realize that there is no grocery at home. And so you have no option. You must wait. Finally, you grab your grocery. You rush to the parking lot. You place them in the back of your car. You hit the accelerator. You speed out of the parking lot. And as soon as you reach the exit, you hold your head and you say, Mother of all, traffic is on the road. You have never seen so many people walking. You have never seen cars moving so slowly. You begin to think, what are my options? Then you realize you have none. You hate to wait, but you must wait. Waiting can be difficult. And even the most patient ones of us sometimes become impatient when we have to wait. We live in a fast moving society, one that feeds us with the message that success means having all you want and having it now and so waiting 
is countercultural. Patience is not something that is revered and taught as it should be. And so somehow when we come upon situations when we have no option but to wait, then we realize that indeed all of us can cultivate the virtue of patience. It's amazing that even the most impatient man will sit patiently and wait without a word when he goes to the United States Embassy to be interviewed for a US visa. A man who likes to quarrel and make a big deal out of small things. When he goes to the embassy, he sits patiently, as humble as a lamb, and waits his turn because he recognizes that he has no option but to wait. God wants to teach us patience, amen? Patience is a virtue that is helpful to us. Patience is a virtue that removes anxiety and helps us to make the best out of life. And so in the scriptures, God admonishes us. He says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Isaiah says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint. Today my sermon is about waiting. The title is Waiting for a Miracle. Waiting for a Miracle. Pray with me, Heavenly Father. Today we stand before you and we ask you to grant us the patience to wait on you in Jesus' name. The story of John chapter 5, verses 1 to 9, comes to us against the backdrop of a religion that was impotent. The Jewish religion at that time was almost impotent. It had a form of godliness but very little power. The priests and Levites and the leaders of the church were more concerned about wealth and fame and personal endeavors than staying close to the wellspring of living waters. And so the gift of healing was almost absent from the church. To make matters worse, Medicine was woefully underdeveloped. And we are told that at that time, there are many doctors who used trial and error, but were very much and almost totally unaware of what needed to be done for those who were ill. Mortality, infant mortality was high. And we are also told that life expectancy was low. At that time, many of the sick and suffering had no hope of getting healing. And so they turned to fables and superstition. And they did things that were unimaginable because they were desperate for healing. And like a drowning man who cling to a straw, they did all they could in the hope of healing. Among the people who were sick at that time was a man described in scripture as a certain man. This certain man of scripture had an infirmity for 38 long years. We are told that this man had suffered many things. You see, beloved friends, I want you to understand that this certain man of scripture recognized that there was nothing else he could do about his situation. This certain man of scripture recorded here in John chapter 5 was a man who longed to be healed but found no healing in the church. 
and at the hands of doctors he didn't get better but you know for us to understand the gravity of the man's situation it is important for me to point out that life expectancy was very low at that time the average lifespan was in the 50s and so a man who had been sick for 38 years was possibly looking to the grave as a desperate and wrecked specimen of humanity you see my friends I want you to understand that this certain man who was sick for 38 years was more likely ill quite longer than he was well but we need to understand that it is a blessing when we are well more than we are sick what do you say sometimes we take things for granted but this man was sick far longer than he was well but we are oftentimes well much more than we are ill to God be the glory amen but you know my friends it is also important to understand that this man though sick for 38 years all he could think about was healing while so many of us who are sick for just a few days and all we think about is dying after 38 years all the man could think about was getting well his hope was strong his hope was bright and even though he was powerless he could not change his situation thank God he was not hopeless after going to all the doctors and they couldn't help him the man decided to go up to Jerusalem and wait at the pool of Bethesda for a miracle I want you to understand that it wasn't easy waiting at the pool there were all kinds of impotent people there there were people who defecated on themselves with nobody there to clean them up there were people who were losing blood bleeding and suffering and the stench of rotten flesh and filth filled the air around the pool of Bethesda it was not easy to wait for a miracle at Bethesda it was not easy the psychological problem was so difficult to bear mourning and groaning and moping and complaining was the order of the day and the law of the jungle was the order of the day for those who were stronger got in before those who were next in line waiting for a miracle at the pool of Bethesda was a difficult thing but the man recognized that there was nothing else he could do he had tried all he could and he could not change his situation so he resigned to waiting for a miracle there are so many of you here today I want to let you know that there are many impotent men in the church today unless you misunderstand me they are impotent women too impotent in the sense that you're unable to change your situation you have a medical situation you've been to the doctors but you can't get better you have a marital situation you've been to the counselors but it can't get better you have a financial situation you have cut your budget but it can't get better you have a social problem and you have tried reform but it doesn't get better and you recognize that humanly you have exhausted all your options and today there is nothing else for you to do but to sit and wait for your miracle but let me tell you something you see this man had friends he couldn't have reached to the pool of Bethesda except that he was helped by his friends but you know those who got him to the pool didn't have the patience to get him into the water your friends can take you so far I said counselors can take you so far 
the best books on the subject can take you so far but so often all the support in the world that you get cannot get you over the edge you still have to sit down and wait for your miracle you've done your best your friends are good friends but they can't solve your problems oh your pastor supports you but he can't solve your problem i said friends can carry you halfway they can carry you so far but no further there comes a time when humanly there is nothing more we can do we have to resign and cast our faith to him above and wait on him for our miracles there are many who are waiting for a miracle in 2009 in 2008 you had so many challenges and you hope that the challenges would have been rolled away but they're still with you and this year you are praying that 2009 will be the year of your miracle there are some who are looking for a miracle of chance and so they go to the lotto line are you hearing me they need a financial miracle and they're looking for a miracle of chance and so day by day they make their way to the big three lines and the lotto lines in the hope that somehow uh, out of the blue a miracle of financial uh, freedom may fall upon them but those of us who are servants of God we are looking for a miracle of divine design not a miracle of chance are you hearing me we look to God as the answer. We look for a miracle, not by randomness, but by divine design in God's own time. Are you hearing me today? We're waiting for a miracle. But you know, let me share this with you, church. Sometimes, when you're waiting for a miracle, it seems like somebody else is stealing your miracle come on now the bible tells us that this man while he was there at the pool of bethesda uh, believing that somehow if he could only get into the water he would be healed but you know every time the water is troubled and he expects to get in somebody else jumps in right before him sometimes you may feel that somebody is stealing your miracle all the things that you are praying for are happening in the lives of people all around you but the miracle just won't come your way oh you met that nice handsome young man and invited him to church and in the back of your mind you are hoping something would happen but as soon as he comes another church sister captures him and before you know it wedding bells somebody stealing your miracle every time you pray and you expect god to do something your friend call you and say guess what god has done and you're still on the outside you're praying for a home and as ju just as you get off your knees the telephone rings and your friend said guess what my mortgage loan has just been approved but yours has been denied it may appear that people are always taking the miracle that you deserve but you know there's a song that says I'm next in line for a blessing. I'm next in line for a blessing. But I want to tell you something today. Sometimes you don't feel like you're next in line. Sometimes when you look at the direction in which your life is going, you feel that you're way at the back of the line and you wonder when you will get to the front today i've stopped by here to tell you that god doesn't deal with lines 
I say God doesn't deal with lines. He deals with divine appointment. And God has a way of skipping the line and coming to you just when you need him. You don't need to be next in line. God doesn't deal with lines. He deals with divine selection. You may be at the back, but in God's book, you're next. I want to share with you today that this man was waiting for a miracle. But you know, he had a problem. His eyes were fixed on the pool. Hear me now. You want God to do it for you but you want him to do it according to your expectation. Oh God, I want you to give me a house, but I want it at Caribbean Estate. You know what you want, and you know how God ought to give it to you. Your eyes are on the pool, and that's a part of your problem. His faith was strong but it wasn't broad he didn't understand that God has a thousand ways to work for his children you see friends when Naaman went to the prophet in search of healing and the prophet sent him to the Jordan River Naaman had a problem he said I thought he would have come out and call upon the name of God and strike the place and make me heal but said no down to the Jordan sometimes your eyes are so much on the pool God wants to bring your miracle but you just can't see it, for your eyes are fixed on the pool take your eyes off the pool and cast them on the Savior your eyes are on the pool and it's a part of your problem God is trying to work it out another way, but as some may expect it, and is this way it must happen, and though God is begging you to shift your gaze from the pool, your eyes are stuck on the pool. When Jesus went to the pool, Jesus had no intention to get the man in the pool. Are you hearing me? But when Jesus said to him, do you want to be healed? Guess what? The only thing the man did was to talk about the pool. There is no man to put me in the pool. To be healed in the pool, he needed two miracles. One to get him in and the other to get him healed. But Jesus was not there to direct him to the pool. Jesus was there to help him to fix his eyes on the Savior. We limit God. And we expect God to work the way we want him to work. And so he brings your miracle when you're not seeing it. You know, let me tell you this. Sometimes, God, you're praying for a house. That's a miracle you want. But you know, people who are working much less than you are, are buying their house and you're not getting anywhere with yours. You see, we oftentimes don't understand that sometimes God places the miracle, hear me church, not on the finished product, but on the raw material. God places a miracle, not on the finished product, but on the raw material. 
when the prophet was hungry and he went to the widow and asked for a cake and the widow said to him all we have in the house meal and oil the prophet said to the widow make me a cake first and then go back and you will find more where you took that from I want you to somehow catch a glimpse church of the living God of the fact that God did not multiply the prophet's cake he multiplied the woman's meal and oil and sometimes you're praying for something that you want God to give you from sky but God has already blessed you with the means to achieve it but because you're looking at the pool you don't even recognize that the miracle you're praying for has already happened in your life yesterday I was waiting for a miracle I felt so ill I didn't know that I could stand here and preach today yesterday I was desperate I called all the doctors that I knew but none of them could see me yesterday I was in need of a miracle I knew I had an appointment to preach today I didn't feel the strength and I went down on my knees and I said God I'm expecting to see the doctors but they're not available and I'm waiting on you for my miracle for I must preach the word today God come through for me you know sometimes you see people do things you don't even know that they're sick they don't look sick but God has a way of working things out my friends what is the miracle that you're waiting for in 2009? You may have tried all you could. Your family life may be falling apart. Your finances are getting out of hand. You long for companionship. You have a spiritual life that is deteriorating and you're hoping for renewal what is a miracle that you are waiting for in 2009 let me remind you as you wait for your miracle that God has a thousand ways to work things out take your eyes off the pool for the pool is a part of your problem you expect God to work and you expect him to work your way Naaman said I thought he would have called upon the name of his God but God said go down to the Jordan River oh friends don't miss the fact that God is working a miracle in your life because you're looking for it some other way I want to let you know as I bring the message to a close that my God is a God of surprises amen I say God is a God of surprises God knows just how just when and he's an on time God God led Israel to a place where they could see no escape and then he opened the Red Sea and took them through God gave them water from a rock he gave them manna from heaven God has a thousand ways of working things out if you're waiting for your miracle remember Take your eyes off the pool and look to the Savior, for God has a thousand ways of working things out. God bless you.